Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you on this beautiful winter's morning. And this is also the first Sunday in the church season of Epiphany as we have winter, spring, summer, fall for natural seasons. We also have the seasons or units to the church here. So we finished Advent in the 12 days of Christmas. Now we're entering the church season of Epiphany. And in this part of the church here, Epiphany meaning revealing or showing forth, uh, we have scripture readings near the beginning of the ministry of Jesus to begin to see this person revealed and people beginning to wonder, who is this? Could it, he's a, such a teacher or maybe a prophet, could he be the Messiah? We see this revealing starting to manifest. Well, we'll be taking down all the Christmas decorations uh, after service today, so if you want to stay and help a little bit with that, that would be great. Uh, we are not late in taking down the Christmas decorations for two reasons. One is, the wise men associated with Christmas are also associated with the very first gospel reading in the church season of Epiphany. And I'll be talking about the wise men uh, some in our uh, sermon today. And so to have our crush scene with the wise men still here is, is okay. Secondly, uh, some traditions, some denominations do not take down their Christmas decorations until a Christian holy day called Candlemas, which doesn't come until February 2nd. So technically, we're still legal happening <laughs> up today. Now, on a more serious note, uh, because of some of the events on Wednesday and its repercussions, I'll be including uh, some reflections in terms of our faith uh, in, in the sermon today and also in the prayer. Uh, I know what's on the hearts and minds of a lot of people right now. For announcements this morning, uh, as I just mentioned, we'll be having the young hanging of the green, so if you can hang around and just help a little with this and that would be appreciated. Our congregational meeting will be on the 24th, uh, and for those who can't make it, we'll be sending out, uh, next week we'll be sending out absentee ballots that can be emailed back or uh, mailed back to the church or simply brought in we, so that we can have a quorum uh, for, between those who come and those who send in an absentee ballot. At that meeting, we'll be talking about uh, our uh, budget for 2021. Commitment forms are in the entrances, and uh, if you would like a commitment form emailed to you, just let the church office know. That helps the deacons greatly in their planning. The offering envelopes are all down in Fellowship Hall. You can pick them up today, or uh, they'll be uh, mailed out uh, within a week or so, they'll be mailed out after that. Taste of Phoenixville is one of the biggest fundraisers for Good Samaritan. They're doing a different kind of Taste of Phoenixville this year. Uh, it's all going to be held virtually over a period of five days. So you can go on their website or go back to our last beacon to get more details about that. But they're really looking for help in this unusual year. Uh, to help with this big fundraiser. Uh, we've been enjoying the poinsettias through all of the Christmas season, but uh, of course this is all coming down. So uh, for altar flowers, if you could bring altar flowers and on a Sunday, please let the church office know and we want to begin to fill up some of this new year for the Sundays for altar flowers. And then uh, finally, uh, PAX Food Drive. The Sewing Circle is holding their PAX Food Drive in January and February. A lot of people are hurting out there. They need food. You can either bring food into the uh, baskets, the wooden baskets provided, or there's a place over in Fellowship Hall for it, or um, uh, checks will be greatly, uh, gratefully received, simply marked PAX in the memo. Well, like the wise men, let us now seek out the Christ child, an epiphany, a revealing of God in the world. Let us worship God.
said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. We may have seen the light of Christ, like the star behind in the sky. And when the man died, we have come to worship. Glory be to God and to Jesus Christ, the Word and the light, in whom God has made known in the power of the Holy Spirit. God is with us always, whom we have heard in Christ's name. Hallelujah. And now, Jim Phillips will sing, As with Gladness, Men of Old. Give the king your justice, O God, 
and your righteousness to a king's son. May the kings of Tarsh and the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Sheba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations give him service. For he delivers the needy and the all, the poor and those who have no honor. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in his sight. And our gospel today is from Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who was born king of the Jews? For we observed his star as it was rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod, Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. So it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called from the wise men and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go and pay him homage. When they had heard that they set out and were ahead of them, went to the star that they had seen in the rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw that the child was with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This ends the end of the word. Arise, shine, for your light has come, says the prophet Isaiah. Light is a constant theme in the season of Epiphany, the church season, and really throughout the Bible in our faith. The Bible says things like, Jesus is the light of the world, and God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The Bible says that Jesus calls on us to let our light shine before others. The Bible says that the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And the whole Bible begins by God saying, let there be light. In our gospel reading today, the light of, sh of a shining star opens the church season of Epiphany. And then weeks later from now, at the end of the Epiphany season, just before Lent begins, the traditional gospel reading is about the transfiguration when the ultimate epiphany, the ultimate revealing takes place. Jesus on a mountaintop shines brightly with the light of heaven, revealing his full divinity to three of his apostles. The light of the star that leads the Magi and then later the transfiguration bookend the church season of epiphany with the theme of light. Another theme in our readings today that we find in all three readings is the epiphany, the revealing of God to those beyond the borders of just the Jews, that God seeks relationships with people beyond their borders. Isaiah says, nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The psalm says, may all kings fall down before him, all nations give him service. The Gospel of Matthew says, in our, as we heard, in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. This is in contrast to uh, something in the book of Acts. We, we have the four Gospels, 
of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That tells us what Jesus said and did. And then after he ascends to heaven, we have the book of Acts, and this tells us, well, what happens next? What happens when the followers no longer have Jesus walking with them? Well, they had a lot of things to work out, and one of the big issues that came up was, was Jesus just for the Jews or for all people? Well, it got so contentious that, uh, it says a little in chapter 11 and then 15, uh, they decided they needed to hold a council, the Council of Jerusalem. And people like Peter and Paul spoke, and they were trying to work out, was Jesus for the Jews or for all the world? The one overseeing that uh, was uh, someone named James, not James the Apostle. He had died in some chapters earlier. This was the half-brother of Jesus, uh, son of Mary. And James listened to all the arguments and finally decided that Jesus was truly to be for Jews and non-Jews alike, Jews and Gentiles, that they did not have to become Jewish to follow Jesus. Well, in thinking about that, I wondered, James who grew up with Jesus, James the son of Mary, I wonder what stories he heard when he was young. I wondered if he remembered when going to the synagogue in Nazareth, <clears throat> hearing prophets like, uh, like Isaiah saying, nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. I wonder if he remembered perhaps hearing his mother speak of some wise men from the east that came and brought gifts for the child from a far off land. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, it says in the Gospel of Matthew. These mysterious magi, they show up and just as mysteriously just disappear into history. They had journeyed from a distant land and then returned to it from, by another road because they had been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. In between the coming and going, it says that when they came to the child, they were overwhelmed with joy and they knelt down in front of Jesus who was with Mary. The wise men says the Bible journeyed and inquired and then they saw and they were overwhelmed with joy. They entered and knelt down and offered gifts. Then the Bible says that they left. They left, but life for them had changed, and they could not go back the way they had come. Now they had, that they had encountered the Christ, they were to travel by another road, a new road for them. We can't know exactly what life was like for the three magi after that encounter with the Christ child, but we can offer an educated guess because lives ending up on a new road after meeting Christ is not an experience exclusive to the wise men. Countless people have journeyed and inquired in their spiritual lives. Countless people have found Christ and they have been overwhelmed with joy. They have found what is called holy. They have been changed, sometimes so dramatically that they found it impossible to return on the road that had led them there. Christ has changed lives and the Spirit has revealed new roads, new paths to follow. Yes, we don't know for sure what happened to the three wise men, but we do know that they were not the same people on their return as they had been at the beginning of their journey. Some legends have them being martyred. Marco Polo, the great explorer, claims that he was shown the three bodies in their tombs when in the area now known as Iran. The only thing we can know is that the visit of the Magi, though brief in the Bible, was not soon forgotten by the wise men who had truly encountered the Anointed One of God. Epiphany, as I said, means revealing, and on this first Sunday of the Epiphany season, as we hear Bible stories of the revealing, the manifestation of God and Christ in the world, we begin with this exotic story that almost seems out of place in the Gospels, and yet which holds a universal truth for all of us. What I mean is that uh, if we are to encounter the Christ, we must, like the wise men, be willing to journey and to inquire. We must look up from our daily world and find guidance from above. We must hope and trust in order to find and see and believe that we will find, like them, overwhelming joy. We must find that place within that is sacred 
and holy where the Spirit resides. We must open its door and allow God's light to illumine its halls. We must accept that, like the wise men, life for us may change and we might find ourselves on new paths, new roads, a holy path led by the guiding light of Christ. The encounter could happen anywhere and at any time and more than once in our faith journey and could be totally unexpected. But for those who look up, for those who remain open, God will lead. And after our encounter with Christ, the ongoing journey may take us in ways unexpected, unforeseen. Many of us know the story of John Newton who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. He had been a slave ship captain, but after encountering Christ, his road began to diverge into a new land and a new spirit inside himself. He found it impossible to return home, so to speak, on the road most familiar to him. It took time and his new road had many twists and turns, but eventually he confessed his great sin and confessed his amazement in the depth of God's grace that saved him and played an active role in the abolishment of slave trading in England. Yes, when you hear the story of the three wise men each year, it may sound exotic to our ears, but really in those wise men to whom Christ was revealed, we find ourselves. We may be curious as to the details of what happened after they left Bethlehem, but in essence, we know what happened to them. They were changed forever. But oh, the battle within and without to hold that divine influence in our lives, that spiritual encounter, to not lose it or forget it or distrust such a new and heavenly truth within. It can be such a battle to know ourselves anew in this world that calls on us to leave all things behind, that uh, things that might insist on a daily basis that we are nothing more than what the day defines for us, hardly leaving room for the spirit to grow. Instead of allowing ourselves to be drawn deeply into our faith, to be gifted with a new revealing, an epiphany from God, we sometimes stop at the point where we see only a reflection of ourselves. The great Leonard Bernstein, composer and conductor, when speaking of the arts, really touches on the spiritual pursuit as well. He said, any great artwork revives and readapts time and space, and the measure of success is the extent to which it makes you an inhabitant of that world, the extent to which it invites you in and lets you breathe its strange special air. Every minister hopes that there will be times when each Christian feels touched by something, something perhaps hard to explain, that feels as if grace has entered one's daily life, that God has touched a moment with the eternal, and for that moment we feel invited to breathe its strange special air. In this season of epiphany, when we speak of God being revealed, made manifest, we can consider wise men from the east who entered a region overtaken by the Romans, full of strife, who, who found right in the middle of, of it all an epiphany from God, quietly lying in a manger with his mother, Mary. Our world today and our lives, like the world of the Magi, can also feel anything but peaceful or joyful or heavenly, especially with the images on TV this week. But this week is also the beginning of Epiphany season, and all around the world, churches in the midst of it all have proclaimed a revealing into our world that has not just survived, but also overcome, that has enlightened generation after generation. Our nation feels in flux right now, divided, but in spite of this sad reality, such divisions can never truly diminish God's message and spirit, a message and a heavenly spirit that have, been, have seen much in its 2,000 years. Hold fast to your faith in good times and bad, in times of peace and times of division. Remember that the good news can be your peace, your guide, your strength, your comfort, and your help even in the darkest times. Our faith is not meant to be seen as some 
delicate flower or just for Sunday mornings. Remember who you are, who you truly are, by keeping your faith close wherever you find yourselves. We're not allowed as Christians to ever set aside the universal truths of our faith. We're not allowed as Christians to see others through any lens that might dehumanize them, even if their actions fill us with anger. We're called to be seven days a week Christians because, especially at times such as this, if not us, who? Who will be the healers? Who will be the keepers of hope? Who will believe in new days? There are times in life when we can say enough is enough and be right. There are times when we can feel righteous anger. Certainly there are times in the Bible when even God feels such things. And we hear Jesus strongly condemn things like the yeast of false teaching, teachings and false prophets, of things like greed and pride. He warns that it would be better to have a millstone put around one's neck and be tossed into the sea than to mislead believers. But then what does God do in the Bible? God always leaves a remnant of hope, a path, a way to read covenant. Many a time, God took the initiative in such healing of relationships and the slow rebuilding of covenant. God did it in spite of our sins and our fallenness. When we're angry, perhaps even enraged, such words of hope and covenanting might sound simply wrong for the moment. That harsh realities need to be faced before we can speak of hope and healing. And it's true that if these words were calling on us to ignore the hard work of the moment, the brokenness of the moment, then certainly go ahead and put such words of faith in a box and mark it irrelevant and put it up on a shelf. But too often, boxes are filled with things forgotten. We are caretakers of a message that never could have lasted 2,000 years if the words could only hold shallow water. We, stewards of the good news, are called on to use this heavenly gift, not keep it safe on a shelf away from the harsh realities of our world as if it might break. A chaplain on a battlefield offers the words of our faith in the worst of human experiences. A minister offering words of faith at a funeral offers such words in the face of death and assures us that they are true and to be believed now and forever. No, our faith is not and never has been words for sunny Sunday mornings only. When Jesus was dying on the cross of Golgotha, translated as place of the skulls, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And these words weren't just for the soldiers that killed them. These words were for all of us. What happened on Wednesday was hard to watch. How could they? Where were the protectors of our capital beyond the police that were wounded and killed? People on TV used words from anger to dishearten, and the entire world watched in disbelief. Certainly, the realities of it all need to be dealt with. But our faith says that true hope comes not from more darkness, one against another, but from light. We all want justice, certainly. But true hope is not found in revenge. The earth is littered with the bones of righteous indignation. No, instead, just as God never gives up on us, we are people of the way found in a savior who forgives and who makes room for hope, who guides and who never loses sight of us as God's children, even at our worst, even on the cross. Someone said that they don't want to even think about trying to relate to any people of the mob that overtook our capital, and it's true that healing in our divided country will be difficult and long. But just as congressional aides took care of the electoral votes and the chaos, we Christians must not leave the message and spirit of our faith behind. There are many people who right now prefer a darkness of their own making. But in this season of epiphany with its theme of light, 
We must be, continue to be light bearers. If not us, who? It's not weakness to call for such an identity at this time as if we're simply running away from difficult circumstances. True weakness is succumbing to hate and seeing people in our anger as the others, them, maybe the enemy. True weakness dehumanizes others so that we can revel in our rage against them or nurse our frustration and anger against them. True weakness subconsciously feels as if the, this is no place or time for our faith right now, when in reality it is exactly the right time and place for it. A house divided against itself cannot stand, said Lincoln in 1858 at the Illinois State Capitol, quoting Jesus. And so let me finish by asking you to pray for our country, to be living expressions of hope, and to believe in the message and the spirit of our faith that has and continues to be a light in the darkness of our world. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith by reading the words found in the bulletin, and we'll read them responsibly. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in Christ all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. Christ, Christ is before all things. Christ is the head of the body, the church. Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Christ might be preeminent. For in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through Christ all things are reconciled to God, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of Christ our God. And now Jim will hear it sing, Do you hear what I hear?
one, God of heaven and earth, even as we hear the fading echoes of Christmas carols filled with hope and joy and peace, we now see around us anger, division, and hatred. Even as we gather in our beloved sanctuary, gratefully proclaiming our oneness in Christ, we know that out in the world, our oneness has fallen prey to what divides us. Have mercy, we pray. Have mercy on us and help us, we pray. We confess a fallen world that needs you as much now as in the past, for you are our true hope and salvation. You are our way. And so we turn to you as generations have done wherever they found themselves through the centuries. We turn to you in hope and trust, embracing your promise to be with us, remembering our Savior who came and shared our common lot. We thank you for the church where we lift up true community, shalom, to the glory of your name. Bless us and help us serve you. Help us to be your disciples in word and deed. May our words and deeds provide opportunities to free us from worldly ways that limit who we are meant to be. We pray for all of our church family and those watching this recording at home. Bring peace to our hearts, we pray, and bless us in all our needs. We ask for your healing presence for all of those on our prayer list and those on our hearts and minds, whether spoken out loud or in the silence of our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The church and the world through Hard times and more peaceful times, through good and bad times, never stops shining its light as an invitation to all to find hope and peace in God's good news. In these days that feel chaotic at the moment, I had moments that reminded me that we aren't owned by the chaos. I watched a pair of cardinals eating seeds under the Japanese maple down by the parsonage. I watched the pickering gracefully flow towards the scoople. I watched and listened also to the wind in the pines the other day right here at the church. Your church, like the birds and the streams, like the pines swaying in the wind, reminds us that there's war beyond the struggles of our world for those who are open to it. The steeple stands tall to remind all that here is peace. Here are truths that lift up the heart and soothe the soul. Here is good news for your lives and our world. We can thank God in Christ for the gift of the church in the world. To support all the work and the good work that our church does here, please consider an offering to the church using the baskets provided or mailed into the church. And thank you. And now Jim will sing, We Three Kings of Orientire.